Hello everyone, a very warm welcome to Chatham House and our discussion on the Israel-Hamas war and its fallout. I'm Roman Maddox, the director of Chatham House. I'm delighted to have with me a bunch of people, I cannot think of really a better panel to be discussing this with us today. We have Professor Daniel Byman of the School of Foreign Service in Georgetown, but of a long distinguished career. He was a professional staff member of the 9-11 Commission, joint staff of the House and Senate Intelligence, and has a long career uh, in academia and as an analyst uh, of intelligence. John Jenkins, Sir John Jenkins, who was ambassador to Libya, Iraq, and also Consul General in Jerusalem, and has many, many years of professional experience in working with uh, countries and people of this region. We have Francesca Albanese, United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Occupied Palestinian Territories. And we have from home team, Dr. Sanem Vakil, Director of our Middle East and North Africa program, and Professor Yossi Meckelberg, one of our associate fellows in that program. Well, thank you all very much indeed for joining me and thank you in the audience as well. We're going to talk about this in three parts, really. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's such an outpouring of commentary, of feeling, of anger, of fear on many sides. One has to divide it up somehow. We're going to begin with the immediate situation on the ground. We're going to then talk about the region, how that this affects the region. And we're going to close uh, our discussion between ourselves with a discussion of what happens to questions of the Palestinians and their statehood or lack of. And I'm going to leave plenty of time for questions. I'm sure that you will all have a lot of questions. Sanem Vakil, I wonder if you could start us off with just talking about where we are now for five days into this, what the, que what the, the questions now are about what happens next. Thank you, Bronwyn. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and I should uh, definitely extend my thanks to everyone who's taken the time to be with us today. This is an important conversation and one that we're gonna continue to be engaging with. Um, there are people far more um, expert than me to be commenting on uh, these next steps and, and the questions ahead, but uh, let me take a stab at uh, what is ahead for Israel um, as well as the region very briefly. Um, I think that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu um, is uh, been mired in days of negotiations at trying to bring together a unity government. Uh, that process is taking far too long, but it will be important uh, for maintaining cohesion uh, domestically. Uh, the question of um, the hostages, I think, is forefront on everybody's um, minds. Um, there are far too high of a number of individuals out there. Um, their locations not known, and I think um, how to recover them safely um, while also preparing for what looks like a ground invasion um, seems to be um, a really uh, hard operation uh, to execute. So that's uh, a space that I'm watching and quite concerned about, and I'm not sure you can bring people home and um, invade simultaneously, uh, but I'll leave that to others. It looks like we're in for a long and brutal number of months. Um, it's very clear, particularly with Western support behind Israel and President Biden's very strong remarks um, yesterday, personal remarks, um, that uh, Israel um, is in for a, a long and a brutal um, engagement um, that is going to be directed at the highest echelons of Hamas's leadership. Um, so it's unclear um, if they will be able to uh, eradicate that leadership. It's unclear what's going to come next in that space. Um, uh, those are important questions to ask. I think finally, I would just say the objective here is also to prevent um, this war from escalating um, and opening other fronts to this war. Uh, Iran is the patron of Hamas and patron of other groups around the region. Uh, Hezbollah has exchanged uh, some uh, back and forth uh, with, with Israel. 
um, and there have been sort of a cascade of threats um, using uh, these groups and and their potential leverage um, as deterrents to prevent uh, this this uh, war from cascading. But I think um, that is a, a real concern um, as well. I'll stop there and and let others respond. Sanam, thanks very much indeed. And we'll come on to some of those questions about escalation. Professor Byman, I wonder if you could take us on from there to address this question of how Israel form its response now to this horrendous assault on it. How does it calculate what to do? So Israel's immediate effort, of course, was expelling Palestinian attackers from Israel proper, and that largely seems to be done, though obviously and, be and, and, kill, and killing them as well. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Just you know, driving them, killing them, uh, removing them completely. Um, the next step is already beginning, which is a mix of airstrikes and tremendous economic pressure on the Gaza Strip, cutting off services and so on. Um, and given the scale of the killing, I would also stress, given the nature of the killing the beheadings, the atrocities against children, the deliberate atrocities against children, a lot of things that have received a lot of play um, in the broader media. Um, this has created a tremendous political dynamic within Israel. So a lot of our previous guides as to what happened before um, do not apply. The call up of reservists is quite large scale um, and it suggests a significant ground operation. Um, in the past, ground operations have been extremely difficult in Gaza. They've been difficult militarily. They've, of course, been incredibly costly for innocence in Gaza itself. So this is a real challenge for Israel's military planning. But Israel cannot go back to the status quo ante. The idea that you simply say, OK, as in the past, we um, try to return to some sort of ceasefire will not work this time. So that means degrading Hamas in some significant way. But that's a very easy statement to say and an exceptionally difficult one to do. Hamas is deeply embedded within society in Gaza in multiple ways. So simply killing a few leaders, taking over some territory is going to be very hard. So this would have to be a prolonged military operation, but even then there's no guarantee of success because of the political difficulty of what to do about Gaza. So let me just take you in for a few things there. and and. Daniel Byman, I should say, you said some things there, including uh, babies being beheaded, which I should say have not been verified. And the Israeli government uh, has itself said it has not seen evidence and what of I, that. What I meant to say there was beheadings have been verified and killings of babies have been verified. So we can. All right. But we have to we have to we have to be careful about these things, because this is exactly uh, through language how how. Um, how arguments um, for certain courses of action can um, can can escalate. Um, so you've you've told us uh, absolutely plausibly that Israel faces a very difficult set of decisions. Do you think it ought to move into Gaza and try to um, get hold of the uh, Hamas leaders? Um, or are the risks, including of killing many, many civilians in, in this incredibly densely built urban area, too great? How should it make that decision? So Israel is going to make the decision based on the political will of the Israeli people and what it sees as its strategic interest. And in the past, Israel has done very tough strikes on Gaza when the, the stakes were lower, when the violence was lower. So there's no question in my mind that this is going to be a very aggressive action on the Israeli part. Um, there is a question of how deep Israel should go into Gaza and how long Israel should stay there. I think part of that will depend on the military difficulty, but it's also important for governments to respond politically to crises, right? If you go back to various crises in the past that have faced you know, the US government, the UK government and others, mm -hmm. and to simply say, there are going to be problems we shouldn't do anything might be an analytic response, but governments need to represent their people uh, to at least some degree. Now, we want them, of course, to act responsibly. We want them to do um, what they can to avoid the loss of innocent life. It's not a license for governments to kill and kill and kill. But I think we have to recognize this political reality is so different than previous conflicts between Israel and Hamas, and that's going to fundamentally shape things. Francesca, is there... 
how would you interpret this core for responsible retaliation? I'm confused. I'm confused by the, the whole framing of the discussion and uh, and allow me to say, I mm. mean, uh, we started the overview with the unity government, with the hostages, which is a critical point. Mm. And so it should stay there with uh, Western support, uh, sorry, with other people, other countries playing behind the scene. And I and uh, affirmation that frankly miss the where are the Palestinians in all this? And it seems that this has started uh, on the 7th of October, where we are in the 56th year of an illegal occupation, which has resulted into decolonization of what remained of Palestine, the territory that should be by international consensus, the state of Palestine and with Israel blockading uh, Gaza for 16 years, bombing it for six times in six years, and and establishing colonies in the in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Yes. So please, this is the context. Hamas action is brutal. Criminal must be condemned mm -hmm. and accounted for. But but let's assume that this is this doesn't start with Hamas. And either we start the logic and we recognize humanity and dignity of all, both Israelis or Palestinians. Or frankly, this discussion is going to repeat the same old record than before, which is frankly extremely condescending. And I have to say, I'm dismayed to hear right now in this uh, in this gathering someone repeating, aff Professor uh, Bayman uh, repeating affirmation that have been uh, claimed back either by even by the the Israeli army that there has been beheading uh, beheading of children and rape until the, this information is verified it shouldn't be shared because it escalates the tension on the ground where people are being slaughtered frankly Fra Fra Francesca I challenged him on that and he and he corrected what he said um what I'm asking you and you've given us very powerfully first uh the important reminder which Chatham House puts into uh, all our range of work on, on on this, that this is a long, uh, bitter uh, conflict, and um, and uh, we discussed it at length in other places, the Israeli settlements and so on. But I'm asking you now, you talked about um, what Hamas has done, mm -hmm. um, a terrorist group, as uh, UK and others uh, uh, have unequivocally labeled it what do you think israel is entitled to do now in uh, retaliation so let's discuss let's discuss what israel is entitled to do under international law yes it's not no, that's, entitled, that's exactly what i'm asking you, entitled, yes, but is not entitled to maintain an occupation in perpetuity is not entitled to maintain a military dictatorship over an entire people because this is this is structurally violence and violence generates and it, it generates response. All okay. colonial systems have met op, uh, have uh, meant oppression and met resistance. So Israel is entitled and has a duty to protect its citizens inside Israel. And Israel is confusing its security with the security of its annexation. And this is this is the first problem. And second, Israel has the has the right to defend itself and its citizens, but there are limits, proportionality, precaution, and distinction, which frankly have all been uh, already uh, violated in the current ferocious attack over Gaza. Gaza was already exhausted and depleted uh, on the 6th of October, and now it's even more closed off because there is nothing that can enter Gaza and nothing that can exit. Mm -hmm. It's leading people to starvation. You'll see if you can join in at, 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 at this this point. This dilemma facing Israel, it wants to retaliate. There's huge national anger, and I'm understating it in using those words. Uh, there is a sense of shock. Or there is a sense of wanting to uh, kill the leaders of Hamas. Um, uh, and there is the long experience of trying to do exactly that in Gaza, ending up with a lot of civilian deaths, international condemnation of Israel for that. And even if killing some Hamas leaders, not um, ex extinguishing Hamas. 
which then then revives. How do you think Israel should calculate what to do now? Thanks, Bonin. You know, of course, everything happens in a context. Nothing is is, is out of, of 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 historical context, of political context, of cultural context. They're all context there. But something happened on Sunday, and we can't ignore it. This is the, in Israel terms, probably it's the, the biggest disaster, not only from Yom, Yom Kippur War, but probably bigger than Yom Kippur, because so many civilians were killed. This is not a license for Israel to go and do whatever it likes in Gaza, no doubt about it. And I think actually what President Biden, as supportive as was his, his speech, probably one of the most supportive speeches by any American president, for many, many years. But he also, it came with a caveat. It came with a caveat, A, we should say democracies. This was kind of a message about domestic politics in Israel. We are allies as, as, as democracies. And the other thing, democracies fight in a different way because they are not a militia. They are not a terrorist group. A, a state is not, is, not, is not, Israel can't behave like Hamas. And Israel doesn't want to behave like, like Hamas. And he says to adhere, and that was uh, one of his final words yesterday, according to the to, to law of, 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 yeah. of war. And that's exactly what it should be. But on the other hand, no one can expect that any country in this situation would respond and respond with great force. But what I think it's important for us to accept, and I think for Israeli leadership and an emergency, an emergency government was just formed, there is a cabinet now, and that just was announced an hour ago, is, yes, dealing with Hamas, but at the same time thinking about the future relations with Palestinians. At the end of the day, no one is going away. Israel's and Palestinians, whether they like it or not, are destined to live together. They can live together the way they live right now, which serves no one. And I think the, the events of the last few days, uh, no one needs to, any, any more illustration of that. So they need to think about whatever they do in Gaza, that there is enough leeway, there is enough space to create that they can actually go back and empower the kind of forces that they can go back. It's not immediate, it will take a long time, but think about the peace after the war and not create another humanitarian disaster without taking away how angry everyone right in Israel. But I think like the words revenging and avenging should probably be in, removed from, from our language right now. Mm. Well, thank you for that. And while I was nodding as you were talking, I suspect um, there are going to be a lot of people, even on this call, who who uh, wouldn't be um, to talk of the peace uh, after the war at this exact point. So, John Jenkins, I wonder if I can turn to you. Uh, British government has, uh, and indeed the Labour opposition, has, has uh, talked about a proportionate response but said that Israel is entitled to respond. We're getting uh, challenges of whether Israel should be entitled to respond uh, in, in the chat and, and those are, are very fluent and eloquent on social media. How, if you were if you were advising the British government as a diplomat, how would you suggest it talk to Israel about Israel's course of action now? <clears throat> um, uh, I think Israel is going to do what it's going to do. Um, I think, um, as as Yossi said, um, uh, I'm, I'm not Israeli and I'm not Jewish, but I mean, this seems absolutely clear to me uh, that this uh, is the most shocking uh, attack uh, that Israel has suffered uh, for decades, maybe um, uh, maybe since uh, since the October War, seventy uh, three, maybe maybe even before that. Um, uh, and so, when you're thinking about about what sort of statements you put out now um, and what policies um, you might want to follow in the weeks to come, because this will last weeks, if not months, and maybe years. I mean, particularly with the hostages. Uh, uh, Gilad Shalit was held for, what, a decade? No, uh, five, year, five years. Uh, well, okay, five years, but a long time. So this is... A, lo a long time. We can agree this is... That. So, you, you know, this is... <clears throat> and I think, as Yossi said, you have to look at what comes after this. I mean, you, you think about where we were a week ago um, when we were all still talking about the new Middle East, the Middle East where um, where old barriers uh, seemed to be coming down, where uh, old enmities were turning into something else. There was this talk of the of the new economic corridor from uh, India uh, up through uh, the Arabian Peninsula. 
uh, um, Jordan uh, and into Israel, maybe about Bejan, going to Haifa. Haifa, historically, the great Mediterranean port uh, of the of the entire event. Um, and now uh, everything seems to have changed. Um, so it looks as if there are two Middle Easts: the Middle East of, of the new Middle East of some of everything changing, and the old Middle East of these uh, of these uh, of conflict, uh, of, uh, of, of 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 hate, um, of, conf of, of, of of violence, of Islamist. Um, uh, uh, irredentism and so forth. Uh, I think the two things exist together. Um, and I think um, a lot of people talk about the, the, the impact of this on, on, on normalization, the normalization um, initiative, such as it was between Saudi Arabia uh, and Israel. Um, and it's interesting to look at the reaction of the Gulf states in particular to this. Um, I think they're trying to preserve their equities. I think it came as a shock to them. Um, uh, I think what they want to do uh, is to and of course, the reason that that Saudi Arabia pursued the normalization uh, initiative through the United States with Israel sure. was because they have domestic priorities. This was the same reason they did the uh, the deal, uh, which was a temporary deal, but it was a deal with Iran uh, earlier in the year. I was ambassador to Saudi Arabia as well, um, by the way. Um, yes, I, I, I'm sorry. I really, no, it's all right. It's all right. It's I, all right. I, I left out one of the main ones. No, no, my CV, my CV is too long. It's a trouble. Um, uh, and I think. That's the thing you need to try and preserve when all this, and I think for Israel as well. You know, it is. I think it is true uh, that there was a feeling in Israel, uh, and, and and this is. I mean, Yossi will know more about this than I do. That Hamas was an issue that could simply be managed in Gaza. You know, if you give them enough, uh, if you give enough work permits, if you allow enough Qatari money in, and so forth, everything will be will be stable uh, until it's not. But you can deal with that later. Well, actually, you can't because in the end. Um, for the new Middle East to be born, you probably do need a political settlement of the Palestinian issue. It hasn't gone away. I, I, I never quite understood what the what the Netanyahu government, what the successive Netanyahu government's uh, uh, um, uh, position on all this was, because they seemed to think that they could simply ignore it and it would eventually go away or diminish in importance to such an extent that it didn't matter anymore. Um, uh, it still matters. And I think when you look at this, but there's another thing. You know, if you look at if you look at the Hamas Declaration of Principles, the new Declaration of Principles, two thousand seventeen, which didn't replace the Charter but supplemented it, um, as ultimately it is the same apolitical document. This is a document that says we will take eventually take the whole of, 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 of what is now mm. Israel back because this is all Palestinian land. This is all rock. That is not a recipe for any sort of sensible politics. So the issue is how do you how do you after this conflict is over, whatever the damage it does, how do you resume? or reinvent the politics of a settlement. Uh, and that's going to be the real um, challenge yes. for all yes. of us, whether it's a Netanyahu government that does it or it's another government in Israel. And then there's the issue of what happens with the Palestinian Authority and who exactly does represent the Palestinians in this age of, uh, of inter-Palestinian turmoil. Well, look, thank, thank you for that. We still have not um, grappled with the central point of the next uh the coming week if you like and, and francesca had raised this question of, of all the things that she's saying israel has done that are against international law what about the um the actual uh, obligations of any response um the siege of gaza if israel kills a lot of civilians what should we um how should we judge that um we're going to have to come back to that because I want to pick up what John has been saying and just go more widely to the region and Sanam if you could take us into this question of where this has left the region we were and you were writing very much about the the Saudi talks the status of those talks for normalization of Israel where has this left that Thank you, Bronwyn. I think uh, this is a segue from uh, John's point. Um, we um, have been in a period um, that has been very much pitched as the new Middle East, a de-escalatory Middle East with dialogue seen all across the region. Um, and we have been watching a very sort of Biden-led effort to fast track normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Um, and, and those talks have been very clearly coming at the expense of uh, Palestinians and, and, and the Palestinian process. Um, Abbas uh, um, has been engaged in, in that dialogue, but um, there hasn't been a, a very clear or open plan as to um, how Palestinians would be brought in um, and there have been deep concerns that um, 
similar to the Abraham Accords, uh, which didn't include the Palestinians, just stopped annexation, if you will, and that was a temporary halt, um, that, that this normalization process would also throw uh, the Palestinians under the bus. Um, and you know this de-escalation de moment that we have been living through and has been applauded by Western um, policymakers, including Jake Sullivan, um, just a few weeks ago, um, has uh, very clearly um, been pragmatic. It's been transactional. It's about prioritizing um, economic interests and engagement um, and, and trying a new kind of diplomacy, but it has very clearly let um, the Palestinian issue slide off um, and slide away, uh, uh, really, um, because maybe there are no new ideas, there's no thinking, there's no bandwidth, um, there's the war in Ukraine. Um, but, uh, you know, through uh, this war and through the brutality, uh, the humanitarian crisis that we're watching, that we will be witnessing um over uh, already, actually. I mean, we don't have to wait too much longer in the future. Um, this is an opportunity to bring the Palestinian issue back to the table, and it requires new and creative thinking, not old thinking. And so I think this is a meta moment still, because if leaders are keen to keep this de-escalatory moment alive to prevent the, the war from cascading, um, it requires engagement on the Palestinian issue, and that requires the Gulf to uh, work together. It requires countries that have ties with Israel, Egypt, Jordan, uh, the UAE, Bahrain, uh, to work the phones, to work the process. Qatar is involved. Um, mm. it, this, if it's, it's a now or never moment for the Middle East. And as part of that process, I'll add this last point, there is an Iran dimension. Iran mm. has been allowed um, uh, Iran's role in the region continues to go unchecked, unhindered. Nobody has reasserted deterrence on um, Iran's strategy. The proxy program functions and it's proving to be sure. effective from Iran's worldview. So that also requires new thinking and new engagement. Sure. Sanam, thank you very much. And I want to mention two uh, questions or points that have come in online for Michael Klein, uh, one say, why is the Egyptian border to Gaza and the Egyptian desire to limit access and free movement of Palestinians not been a subject of discussion? And another saying, making the point, the essential point that Hamas and Palestinians are not the same. Hamas has as a stated goal to kill all Jews and the actions were a step uh, in that path. How do those who support Palestinian goals reconcile the Hamas goals, um, reconcile those with the, the, the Hamas goals? Francesca, could you I want to respond to what Sanam was taking us into of whether there is any way that the current circumstances can lead to, again, more regional engagement and indeed engagement from the, the, the US on the Palestinian question? Uh, thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I can really speak to the regional political reality, because this is not where my expertise is. I'm worried, though, because I see an escalation of tension. And um, again, I see regional actors being shaken, but no one really, at, at this point in time, these days, as of Saturday, no one really keen to, to, step, uh, to step out. We know that from public uh, statements that Iran has said that, that it it has nothing to do with the with the attack uh, uh, unleashed on the seventh of September uh, by Hamas. Um, and he, in a way, I say there are we should be neutral in assessing the the influence of various actors in the region. In the sense, uh, it's uh, that there is it's not. I often claim that there is uh, international inertia versus the question of uh, Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory. But in fact, no one is inert. So far, there has been um, sort of blanket support to Israel. Of course, now mm. it's now it's clearly justified because the, the suffering and the pain that has been inflicted on Israeli civilians is, is shocking. Uh, the point is, the Palestinians, and again, no, not to justify anything, but the Palestinians have gone through brutal killings times and times again, because there are 4,200 Palestinians who have been killed in the last 15 years in Gaza, including mm. 1,200 kids. 
I beg you to bring them to the equation because someone who's 16 year old today has never stepped foot out of Gaza, but has gone through, um, through six wars. Imagine a person surviving a war, how traumatic his or her existence is. And these kids who have gone through six wars. So this is the reality that is being nurtured through 16 years of blockade. And again, I want to reinforce what has been said before. The Palestinians are not Hamas, and Hamas mm -hmm. is not the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I mean, I want to recall something that was said by some by Israeli um, politicians, I think it was Motrik, but he was not the only one. No later than a few months ago, he said he was criticizing the, the, the engagement with, uh, with the PA, and he was mentioning Hamas as an asset. This, in, this is in the public record. So um, again, the the, the status quo was untenable because you cannot keep an entire population oppressed. So the way forward for me, and this is a critical moment, is legality, legality, legality. We have international law, which is very prescriptive, very clear on what is the perimeter of for political actions and this is the the wisdom and the even-handed approach that we need to use in these tragic hours okay thank you for that i think we still have hanging there the question uh from the beginning of whether if israel goes in to gaza in pursuit of uh, hamas leaders uh kills civilians as a result, but not uh, not that not being its prime goal, or its its siege of Gaza leads to people's death, whether that is is legal or not legal, I'm just waiting for people's clear. Um, it's illegal. I can tell you. Yeah, the, you the, the blockade is unlawful. Is illegal. That the occupation is unlawful. Is illegal. As it's illegal in Crimea, yeah. and in Donbas, and so is illegal in the occupied Palestinian territory. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. I wonder. If you could take us just into this wider regional question, do you think this will extend to Iran? Does Iran want this to extend to Iran? And how is the US going to play this? So this is one of the biggest questions in the air right now. So on the negative side, we've already seen the Lebanese Hezbollah launch uh, limited attacks on northern Israel. Um, I would stress the word limited. This is not Hezbollah remotely near its full capacity. Uh, we've also seen some attacks, to me, who the actor is, is unknown, uh, emanating from Syria. Um, Iran, of course, is very close um, to Hezbollah and has significant ties to Hamas, helping arm, train, and fund Hamas. So Iran certainly wants the pot stirred, long regarded Israel as an enemy. It sees Israel as actively attacking Iran with the murder of Iranian scientists and uh, military officers. Um, and it also sees a regional plot against Iran with things like the Israel-Saudi normalization as being directed against Iran. So Iran certainly has a lot of incentives to create unrest. Um, that said, both Iran and Hezbollah have reasons to be cautious. Um, when Hezbollah fought Israel in 2006, Hezbollah did very well militarily, but it also suffered tremendously as an organization. It lost a lot of its people. Hezbollah also was criticized within Lebanon itself, where many Lebanese were very bitter about the destruction that came with the war. And Israel has made it clear it will have a very destructive response to any major Hezbollah attack. And so right now, my personal belief is Hezbollah, with Iran's support, is trying to walk a careful line. It's showing to show what it says is solidarity with Hamas, mm -hmm. trying to show that it's active, but at the same time, signal to Israel that it wants to be careful about escalation. But all that's easy to say. When you're actually using military force, things can easily get out of control. And signaling can be misinterpreted, um, and passion is high, right? Uh, as we discussed, Israel is enraged uh, because of the scale of this attack. Um, the uh, current suffering, but likely increased suffering of innocent Palestinians mm -hmm. is going to enrage audiences uh, throughout the Arab world. And as a result, we're going to see calls for action, even when people believe it's illogical. So mm. I wouldn't rule out a greater uh, regional involvement, even though I think there are many reasons um, mm. to say that it won't happen. 
So let me ask you just directly two questions that have come in. One from Gustav Kochis saying, do you think it is possible that a disproportionate Israeli response causing excessive human suffering, well, that word excessive doing a lot of weight in that sentence, could result in Western support to Israel? And another one from Jose Salamanca saying, is there growing support over the Palestinian cause? He particularly picks out demonstrations in San Francisco and the statement from Harvard students and is that likely to change U.S. support? So um, in general, these crises tend to follow certain dynamics where there is a lot of attention due to attacks on Israel. And I would say, again, given the scale and the nature of these attacks, there'll be even more sympathy for, towards Israel. And then over time, there's the Israeli response, which is widely criticized and creates sympathy on the Palestinian side. I suspect without knowing, we'll see a similar dynamic here where we'll see support for Israel and then some countries like the United States that are very strong supporters will be more um, willing to back Israel as military operations go on, but others that were more lukewarm in their support start to drop off very quickly with calls for a ceasefire happening. Um, within the United States itself, President Biden um, is very much trying to position himself and the United States as squarely in Israel's corner. That was a very strong statement. And I think that he's going to stay with Israel for quite some time, knowing the Israeli response is going to be very tough. Um, not to delve too much into US politics, but uh, the people who are critical of the Biden administration on this are hardly likely to support a Republican alternative under President Trump, right? It's not like the alternative political position is saying, be gentle to the Palestinians. So I think Biden feels secure politically, knowing that the people who are criticizing him are still mm -hmm. likely to end up supporting him in the end. Thank you for that. You'll see, I wonder if you could take us back to the point that that, that Sanam and Francesca were talking about and, and uh, threading through this, as I promised, which is whether this brings the question of, of a deal with Palestinians, it brings inescapably back uh, to the forefront, this question of what is going to happen to arrangements between pal uh, Palestinians and Israelis. Is it, is it, is it, can you see a way forward for that? or? Is this uh, this government uh, and, and many Israelis just saying, what is the point of talking to these people? You'll see you're on mute. Not a subject in which people stay muted for long. So. Oh. Um, I wonder if one of my wonderful team can release you'll see from his um, computer silence. Um, you'll see while, while the team is kind of wrestling with that, um, John, could I turn to you just on, on this question? Can you see anything bringing back um, a way to talk about the future of the Palestinians? Uh, I don't know what it Israel. is, but but it's, it's I think it's gonna have to happen. And I've always thought this. I mean, I, the, the, the thing is, that the, you know, <clears throat> I never understood with the Netanyahu governments. Uh, you have whatever it is, 1.92 million Palestinians in Gaza. You've got whatever it is, 3.7 or something, and 3.5 in the West Bank, more in Jerusalem. What happens to them? Where do they all go? Now, it's true. I mean, as Francesco and others have said, that Hamas are not Palestinians, are not the Palestinians, nor in that, for that matter, are Fatah the Palestinians. I mean, the Palestinians, you know, the Rabat summit, of course, said, you know, the, the PLO was the, was, was the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. That is a, a fiction then, it's a fiction now. You've got to f find some, some political mechanism by which, you know, Palestinian aspirations can be politically uh, 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 um, uh, focused, discussed, and resolved. That doesn't exist at the moment. If the Israelis sweep through Gaza and uh, and destroy, I mean, which is what they say, which is what Avi Dichter says they want to do, uh, the entire uh, Hamas military and also political uh, structures there, there will still be Hamas figures in exile, but they will not exist anymore as 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 a, as a coherent entity uh, within within Gaza. Whatever the implication, the implication of Hamas uh, into the population, and it's interesting to look at polling on 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 Hamas popularity in Gaza. Khalil uh, Shikaki up in Ramallah, there's a lot of this stuff. It goes up at times of conflict, then comes down mm. at, at times of peace. So there is this, and I think if you if most if you look at the so all the polling that we see from from it, within Palestine, in the West Bank, and indeed in 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 Gaza, it suggests that Palestine. It's true that they've lost faith in the two-state solution, but that's because they've lost faith partly in the in the Palestinian Authority, which they think they think is corrupt and useless, which it is. 
And I think, and, and, and Hamas are not the answer because Hamas do not offer a political, a political horizon. They offer a millenarian horizon, and that that, that, that cannot work. How this how this political how a, a construct how a, a realistic, credible, uh, uh, and authoritative political interlocutor on the Palestinian side emerges, um, I don't know. I, I do think that the other, particularly the Gulf, particularly Saudi Arabia, will in the future have a role in this because I don't think the the, the, the Saudis. Um, uh, have lost an appetite for normalization. They always knew that their appetite for normalization was not as great or as insistent as Netanyahu's appetite for, for normalization, which is why they were they were constantly raising the price of normalization. But I think that that will remain after all of this. Mm. I think we will see, you know, changes in 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 popular opinion as this uh, as the Israeli uh, assault on Gaza uh, continues. That happened. It happened in two thousand and six. I mean, in two thousand and six. You could go into Khan Khalili in, in, in Cairo and you would see the three pictures on the wall. You would see uh, Nasrallah, Khamenei, and Assad, the Holy Trinity. You'd see, the, you'd, you'd, you'd see them everywhere. That ended. I mean, you don't see them anymore. And that's partly because of the Syrian civil war. Of course, Assad has killed, tortured, and exiled millions of his own citizens. So it shifts. It, 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 when the conflict is over, people will still have to come back to this issue of what happens to the Palestinians. Um, and that's, I, mean, I don't know what the answer to, to that is. I just know there has to be an answer. Thank you for that. Sanam, do you agree with that? Um, not to sound like an echo chamber, I do agree. Um, I We don't know what is going to come next, but we need to be helping to cultivate um, uh, and support Palestinian leadership, uh, leadership that um, can come uh, from within, come up, that's youthful, um, that empowers younger generation voices, um, and that begins uh, to create a consensus on the way forward. I think uh, the Palestinian leadership has been, uh, at least in the West Bank, stagnant, uh, no elections um, for over 15 years. A bus needs a circulation of elites is a really important concept um, to uh, bring people along and to create buy-in and, and um, investment um, in in. The current status quo but in the future so i i would think that that's where we should be um placing our interests i think we should be thinking about um anticipating where we where this conflict is going to go and help to nourish and 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 bring people together uh to start working in that space um and and that should be happening quite urgently and quite now i'm i don't know if yossi's um uh, is yossi returned audio returned is working us. but i think he has a lot to say about this Yossi, have we I can you, hear me? you? Excellent. Yes, we uh, can. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just <laughs> the computer does what the computer does. Uh, you know, one point I think is very important because we're entering into a period, as Daniel said, that the, the war with has its own dynamic. And it's very difficult in these early days. I know for some of us, the last five di days like as eternity, feel like eternity, but <laughs> it's it will go rage on. And I think the role now is to look into the future and to think where do we want to be all sides at the end of it. But I think we don't have this privilege, you know, of self-indulgent to think, oh, you know, it's all done. I think this is exactly the result that we see now that the international community abandoned the, 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 the urgency to deal with, with, with looking for, for creative, innovative solution for too long, many parts of, you know, whether in the United States or in the European Union, everyone said that we fell into the, the, the trap of the status quo. And you saw obvious there was no status quo. The situation was getting worse and worse. You can't ignore the kind of the conditions on the ground which are changing all the time. Call it status quo. Status quo served, served, served Israel, didn't serve the Palestinians. At the same time, also the status quo among the, the leadership, the, the PLO leadership, maintained the same people, the same ideas, the same concept, and at some point of view, someone will try to bring. Obviously, what happened this week is horrendous and, and leads to a much worse situation before. But we need already to think now, and I know this is the, the, the difficult thing while the war is raging, to look at the day after. And to mm. believe, that instead of looking where the border is going and how much compensation the refugees get, we need to think about the values. We need to think what we at the end of, of any peace process and any political engagement, 
we like everyone to enjoy. So when we look at the situation in such a small territory between the, the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, we like to say everyone enjoy the same political right. We like to have everyone to enjoy the same human rights. We said to say this, anyone enjoy the same, same civil rights. So and if we start yeah. with the values instead of from the details of where the border exactly, then we can actually can come up with, with new ideas. The second thing, we need the space for new leadership to emerge. We also neglected grassroots. Everyone, you know, people use the mm. term, we don't want normalization, we don't we don't agree with people talking to because it makes it one yeah. the situation yeah. worse. And we have to move exactly in the opposite direction. Okay, well, thank, thank you for that. Francesca, and I, I'm going to st stir in even more questions we've had, but we've been talking a lot about the two-state solution, whether or not it has any future. Let me just read out a few, quite a few remarks that are on this from Lawrence Bano bettel what do you expect to happen in the West Bank repositioning participation? Um, let's see, there is um, uh, Keith Tracy saying, surely the two-state solution is long dead, need true democracy. Um, there is another one from um we have a lot of questions so sorry for my my That's pausing fine. um and, and and others asking what about the two-state solution francesca from your perspective and work very much close on the ground in the yeah divide palestinian territories what do you make of that yeah i think that we shouldn't confuse the two-state solutions which is probably the only thing on which there is international consensus other than the treaties that everyone has signed and um, and however well, remains like um, like dead letter, but however there is consensus on the two-state solution. The problem is confusing Oslo as a way with the two-state solution. Mm -hmm. Oslo has been an attempt. Uh, I cannot say. I'm sorry. I cannot. I cannot force myself to say to realize the two-state solution because this is not the case. Oslo it has not been unsuccessful. Oslo has been very successful at creating the matrix that is currently in place, where Israel has gained more uh, control, 60% of the West Bank has further fragmented the territory, separating the, West, the, the Gaza Strip, as yet started to do uh, since the very beginning of the occupation, and this is fully documented, and East Jerusalem. So before I get into what a two-state solution could look like, I would say that we should probably question the validity of Oslo uh, mm. if it's interpreted against the right of self-determination of uh, the Palestinian people, because they are the ones deprived of these fundamental rights, which is an erga omnes obligations for the international community. So everyone should act for the realization of this right. And my question is, how can a two-state solution and how can we think of peace without, I mean, with the current, with the status quo that, I mean, personally, I was clearly not comfortable with the pre-7 uh, pre October uh, reality which is um, a, a reality where uh, the right of self-determination continues to be violated by more taking of the land for, yeah. for the colonies, yeah. Yeah. there are 300 colonies right now. Uh, dispossession, forced displacement of the occupied uh, population. We talk about, we can criticize the Palestinian, the Palestinian leadership as much as we want, and it's fine, I'm with you. But the point is that this is not an, like, um, this has never been envisaged to be uh, like an outer reality or an, an equal reality to Israel, mm. it's part of the occupation itself. So mm. it doesn't, it plays the role it plays. It's, it's not there mm. to protect the Palestinians or its, its, its interest. And so with, uh, yeah, without the so, possibility to form a political leadership under occupation, without the possibility to enjoy rights, the, without the possibility to really exist culturally, economically, politically as a people, I don't think there is any, any viable future. So the, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I guess, thank you. Um, for that, but you wouldn't be the first to um, to take that that particular view. Yossi, just take us into the politics of Israel now and and the trends of the uh, of that politics. Do you see, given um, the, this particularly conservative government, given that they, that all the political forces pushing that have been pushing Israel in that way, do you see any uh, Israeli government being capable of this kind of uh, dialogue and indeed concession? I don't. I, I don't think so. 
But I think at the same time, what happened at, on, on, on Sunday, on Saturday, Sun, it was an earthquake in Israel uh, politics. And the idea that any prime minister can actually survive such an earthquake, uh, Prime Minister Golda Meir didn't survive more than a few months after the, the Yom Kippur War. Uh, Ehud Olmert would have gone probably after 2006 on something on, uh, compared to what happened this week, much minor. And so the, for Netanyahu, it's essential to stay in power mainly because of his corruption trial. But he, po he positioned himself as Mr. Security and security failed, failed completely. Right now, actually by adding people like Gantz and, and Gidon Saar into the government, the, he does exactly what he so much ag was against, is to prepare them to take over eventually. And it's hard for me to see how they're not going to election probably at some point in the near future. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no commission, an investigation into the failures of the war. And at the end of the day, the, the, the buck will stop with the prime minister. Also because some of the appointments to key position that led to this, to this disaster. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at in terms of two-state solution, probably this is not the government that is capable. But sometimes we saw in the history, after 73 came actually a few years later, a new government and peace with Egypt. After the first intifada came Madrid, came, came Oslo. So actually, you know, yeah. if I'm trying, maybe I'm holding, I'm clutching straws. But I think that sometimes after major, major failures also creates also the opportunity and for, for new thinking. And this might just might be the case here too. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to read out a few more. Uh, one from Fernando uh, Herrero saying, is there any difference between Tories and Labour under Starmer um, uh, under, under, uh, on this big uh, crisis? What are the possible positions? I haven't heard proportionate response. Uh, they have both used that uh, um, in the past couple of, of days, but thank you for that question. Uh, there's quite a lot on interesting ones on motives here. One from Hugh Jenkins on, does the panel have a view of what Hamas is seeking here? Um, which I think is a very good one. And then various questions about Egypt, which I want to uh, stir in about what, where Egypt has positioned itself in this and whether um, Israel is trying to drive the Gazans into Egypt. Um, and from Michael Ingber, can it not be safely said, this is a deeply, I guess, ironic question uh, that all Arab countries would be or are uh, ready to sell the Palestinians for their own interests. Um, motives of Hamas, of Arab countries in this, uh, of Egypt. I wonder if uh, some of you could take us into this. Sanam, Daniel, John. Sure, very quickly. Um, I'll, I'll take Egypt um, to start. I think Egypt is um, in a hugely difficult position. It shares the Rafa uh, border crossing, uh, connecting uh, the Strip, uh, Gaza Strip to the Sinai Peninsula and under President Sisi, who is a very national security oriented, oriented leader. Um, he has taken a very sort of strong uh, securitized approach against the Muslim Brotherhood, um, which is as almost um, ideologically aligned with Hamas. Um, Egypt has uh, blocked imports, um, tried to curb um, the outflow of tunnels, um, and uh, there is a concern that uh, there will be um, pressure on the border. Israel um, struck that border just recently, a few days ago. And uh, there's, you know, the influx of Palestinians um, on this closed border crossing um, is going to add to what is already a humanitarian crisis. And I think that this is where uh, there needs to be a huge amount of attention. Prime Minister Netanyahu said very clearly, Gazans need to go. Um, and what is really unclear is there is nowhere for them to go. Absolutely. Um, and that border crossing is, um, I hope, uh, will be opened. Um, but I think that um, Egyptians, but also the broader European community needs to be involved uh, in that space. Um, there have been um, really uh, negative backlash to migration crises um, across Europe with Italy bearing the brunt of that crisis. Um, and so this is going to have a cascade that I hope policymakers are thinking about. Um, 
and the Egyptian political establishment is already fragile. CC is meant to have elections in December. The economy is um, not in a good shape. So again, uh, there is another sort of vicious uh, circle of uh, very difficult decisions um, that need to be made. And, and again, it's not clear who's going to be making them. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, do you want to come in? I do. Let me talk about possible Hamas motivations. And I would stress there's a lot we don't know. Um, Hamas has been in a situation where it's been losing politically in multiple ways. It's trying to govern Gaza in the face of um, significant Israeli and international economic isolation. And as a result, has not been able to claim legitimacy among the Palestinian people for simply being the best at outgoverning its rivals. Um, it also is losing some of its, what it would call its resistance legitimacy, legitimacy that comes from its use of military force. It's in uh, at times cracked down on anti-Israel groups in Gaza, and it's been criticized not only by other more militant organizations, but also by fighters within Hamas who say the organization is not committed to fighting Israel. Um, and all this concern about loss of legitimacy is happening when Palestinian politics are in turmoil. The Palestinian Authority, which governs the West Bank, um, there is a leadership uh, succession crisis that's beginning. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas is 87 years old. He's a chain smoker. And who leads the Palestinian national movement in the future is very much in question. Um, add to this the sense among Palestinians that they're being left behind as regional normalization occurs. And the last thing I would say is simply a tremendous sense of anger and desire for revenge. And to me, all this is kind of combined into a very combustible cocktail. Hmm. Thank you. John? Um, I agree with all that, and I agree with what Sanam said. I think there's another issue with Hamas, because it, it is striking that they didn't... I mean, this, and actually, the, the previous two, I think, occasions when they've launched rockets into Israel, they've claimed to be uh, uh, acting on behalf of Alexa, uh, which is uh, so... Uh, uh, there's an ethno-nationalist strain to Hamas, and there's, a, there's an Islamist uh, strain um, to Hamas, and they're, they're clearly emphasizing the uh, the, the Islamic umatic, um aspect of, of a struggle uh, in an attempt to draw in um, um, Muslim states more widely. And it's interesting, actually, that um, that uh, uh, there has been some response elsewhere, <clears throat> elsewhere, but it's not been huge. So we'll see. I mean, I think you know, as this as this plays through, we'll see what what what, what other appeals they make uh, to Islamist uh, and Islamic um, uh, solidarity. Um, yeah. I think uh, the Egyptian angle, um, everything that Sanam said is, is true, but interestingly, what this also does is make is is make Egypt um, important again. Uh, I mean, historically, the, the 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 earlier question, you know, why 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 is why, why the Egyptian control the crossing at Rafa? They don't want Gaza back. They've never they haven't wanted Gaza back for the last five decades, and they don't want it because they've got enough problems of their own in uh, in Sinai. Uh, they've now got a hundred and whatever it is, hundred and ten million citizens instead of the ninety two they thought they had three years ago. They've got massive economic problems. Um, they can do uh, uh, they, they they can do with Gaza like a hole in the mm. head. Um, mm. Equally. They were the ones who managed Gaza on behalf of the the, the Arabs in general. It would be under 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 Mubarak. It was they did it through Aegis, the the uh, the external security uh, organization with Omar Salman. That yeah. then actually became frayed after yeah. Mubarak's fall, and it's not clear who yeah. was with, with Hamas. And I think it probably still is an issue. Yeah. But, you know, John, we are actually going to have to. Okay, just one, one, just one quick micro thing. micro point. You, given that the Egyptians do have all these problems, they can now perhaps. Exact a price from the Gulf states for acting yes. as their proxies in dealing with with uh, with Gaza. That is a really good point. We're going to have to draw it to a close. I'm just going to mention a few more questions that have come in, which I couldn't stir in as questions, but from uh, Shafi Aldebar, um, whether the rise of a Palestinian death toll would shift public opinion in the in the West. Um, a lot of people saying. Um, don't equate Hamas with Palestinians, and the Palestinians have been um, not got the kind of international attention they, they want because of the groups within them. Uh, others asking whether Professor Mecklenburg would really thinks that one million settlers, uh, a number he says will soon be reached, could be moved by an Israeli government. Um, Ismail uh, Berkman saying that international law 
does not apply in the uh, Gaza Strip and um, others writing in um, Batul Arafay uh, as a Palestinian refugee, uh, again, saying what recourse uh, really does he have to international law? Some of these points we're going to bring back. The biggest lump of questions that I haven't stirred in is, is over um, mediation and what other countries can do. Also the future uh, of the Palestinian negotiations and the two state solution and, and settlements and so on and role of many other countries. So I think we are planning other events very soon and we'll come back to these. But may I just thank my distinguished and passionate panelist and thank you all very much for coming and for sending your questions. I'm so sorry I couldn't get more than a tiny fraction of them in, but thank you and see you very soon on this.